In this second video on the multiplier, I want to talk about what we what we know or what we think we know about uh, the multiplier in the real world in in real economies. So, as we know, you know the multiplier is essentially a ratio. It's a ratio between an autonomous change in spending. We we usually think of this as a change in government spending or, or government taxes in some cases, um, and the final change in GDP. The logic of the multiplier uh, does apply, you know, to changes in demand that originate from other sources, a, a sudden increase in a country's exports or in business investment in principle, the same, the same factors that cause a change in government spending to have a larger, smaller effect on GDP will, will mostly, maybe not entirely, but, but generally apply to those other sources of demand as well. But the context that the multiplier is most often discussed is uh, a change in the government budget position or fiscal position. Fiscal, just of course, referring to anything having to do with the government budget. Uh, fisc, some an old word for, for treasury. Uh, so, uh, so what do we know or what do we think we know or what do economists think they know about multipliers in the real world? Well, in a general way, uh, Let's let's go through a, a, a few issues here. Actually, first of all, um, in in a sort of modeling context, we we generally talk about the output multiplier, dollars of GDP, a dollar of change, eventual change in GDP per dollar of change in spending. But in some uh, empirical and and policy contexts, we're more interested in the employment multiplier, the number of uh, typically job years, year of one person working one job, uh, produced by a certain amount of, of public spending. So again, if we're making a model, we're almost always going to be talking about the output multiplier. But in a policy or empirical context, we might uh, be looking at the output multiplier, or we might be looking at the um, employment multiplier. Now, there are lots of debates about uh, the typical size of multipliers or the size of a multiplier in any particular um, situation and the, the range of estimates you can find in the empirical literature is quite wide. Um, and this is anytime you're having a debate about the appropriate size of, of a budget change in a budget position, the effect of a, a budget surplus or deficit on the level of activity, the size of a stimulus, let's say as in the current situation, the size of a stimulus package required in order to close an output gap. Um, the question of how big is the multiplier uh, likely to be in this particular situation is, is going gonna, is gonna to rear its head. So a lot of debates about that. Um, there's also, you know, debates about what are in general the factors that are going to make a multiplier larger or smaller, and what are the situations in which a multiplier will be larger or smaller. And one particularly central issue here is the question of monetary accommodation. Um, again, the sort of consensus in macroeconomic policy for, for quite a number of years now has been that the primary responsibility for managing the overall level of demand, the overall level of output, employment, inflation in the economy, really macroeconomic policy almost across the board, is, is the central bank. And if we imagine that, so, that, so a central question then becomes if, if a change in the budget position, a change in the level of spending or taxes would produce a change in the level of output and the, and the variables associated with output like employment and inflation. Will that effect in a sense be allowed to actually take place or will the central bank try to offset it in some way? Will the central bank try to cancel out what is happening uh, because of, of, of the change in the budget position? So that's the question of monetary accommodation. Accommodation meaning in some sense, the central bank is going to allow this change to happen or depending on how you look at things facilitate allowing this change versus a lack of monetary accommodation, the central bank is going to follow a policy that's that's going to tend to cancel out. And a lot of the debates about the size of the fiscal multiplier really are not debates about sort of the economic substance, but the question of whether or not we expect the central bank to, to accommodate it. Because in general, the view, I think, fairly, fairly logically, is that if, if we imagine a situation where the central bank is trying to cancel out what the, what the, what the budget would otherwise be doing, the effect of the budget is going to be smaller. That makes sense. Um, there's also a question of timing or persistence in, in a model. Again, we don't have to worry over much about exactly how fast this is happening or when this is happening or for how long it's happening. 
but in any kind of concrete policy setting we do, and also in empirical research we do, because for instance, if we think a multiplier typically takes effect over several years, and we try to measure it by looking at the effective output in the same year as the spending takes place, our estimate is gonna to be too small. So as we move to the real world, we have to really foreground this question of, of the time frame over which we think this multiplier process is happening. Now, with all of these factors pushing this way and that way, we still, in a lot of conversations for, for the United States, people tend to end up with, with assuming, assuming a reasonable degree of monetary accommodation at a figure like 1.5. If you think that the multiplier for the United States you know, today is in the vicinity of 1.5, nobody is gonna look at you like you're crazy. That's, that's sort of accepted as a reasonable number. And, and we'll talk momentarily about uh, you know, whether that number, how that number might look for, for other countries. So um, employment multiplier, as I said, is, is something you find in a fair amount of the empirical work, and it's usually defined as the job years per dollar of exogenous spending. So again, here we see again the, the time in question that, uh, you know, if $100,000 results in one additional person getting a job that year or one half of an additional person getting a job over the next two years or whatever, that, that would be one job year of spending or if, if it results in two people getting a job at the time the spending takes place, but only those jobs only last for six months, again, that would be one job year. So we often, we often find empirical work that's, that's set up this way. The employment multiplier as a concept is actually slightly older than the sort of conventional Keynesian multiplier. It was first sort of, um, the, first, the first sort of discussion of it, analysis of it is, is Richard Kahn, who we really know as Keynes's protege, one of his most you know, in the uh, in the in the Cambridge Circus, which was sort of the kind of Keynes's inner circle when he was developing, and 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 then you know, kind of um, proselytizing for the ideas in the general theory. The Cambridge Circus uh, was sort of his 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 inner inner circle of of followers who who kind of helped develop and then popularize his ideas. And Richard Kahn was one of the central figures there, but he was also an economist. Um, in his own right, and actually, you know, had had a notion of the multiplier somewhat earlier than Keynes did, and Keynes perhaps um, really really um, built his idea on that. But but Kahn's version of it was was framed in terms of employment per additional dollar of of spending, as opposed to output per dollar of additional spending. So. Partly we might do it this way because we think it's easier to measure, easier to study, but we might also do it this way because in many cases, the actual ultimate goal of the policy is to lower unemployment. So output is just a change that is sort of happening along the way there. So it makes more sense if you if it's easy, just as easy or easier to estimate to focus on the employment effect. Or again, if we're defining, you know, potential output in terms of full employment, in terms of some target level of the unemployment rate, then again, the ultimate question for assessing whether you know a given let's say stimulus package is, is the right size is what its effect on employment is going to be and there was a lot of research on employment multipliers in particular following the uh the 2009 stimulus bill the uh, american recovery and reinvestment act which really kicked off just a lot of, of renewed interest in multiple the multiplier had really was not a concept that macroeconomists were particularly interested in during the sort of period of the 80s and 90s when it really seemed like macroeconomic management could just be left to central banks. And after the, the great financial crisis of a bit over a decade ago, and, and the clear evidence that central banks and conventional monetary policy were not able to stabilize demand, it really triggered off this, this real renewed interest in, uh, in, in estimating multipliers and thinking about multipliers. So, um, uh, this is from, from uh, Gabriel Chodoro Reich, uh, a young economist, um, youngish economist, um, uh, did a, uh, has done, this is from a paper that he wrote a few years ago, um, uh, just sort of summarizing kind of the state of the discussion on employment multipliers. Um, I believe his, his dissertation, which got him a job at Harvard was, was on the um, effectiveness of the 2009 stimulus bill um, in boosting demand. Um, Berkeley, Berkeley guy. Anyway, this is a this is a, a from a paper of his, sort of looking at um, uh, at 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 just a variety of studies of employment multipliers. As you can see, the the effects are estimated in terms of job years per per hundred thousand dollars of additional spending, and we get numbers. This his two thousand twelve paper, which again I believe is is the published version of his dissertation. He ended up with a three point eight three each hundred thousand dollars of additional 
spending, uh, looking specifically at the at the federal assistance medic, it was for various reasons he he thought that you could get a particularly clean identification. This is the thing empirical economists are always worried about. How do you how do you how do you know that the thing that you're measuring is actually the thing you're interested in? This is the problem of identification. He thought he could get a particularly clean identification if he looked at Medicaid spending and using that found um, each $100,000 of additional spending produced um, nearly four additional job years of employment. But you can see, you know, the studies in here, um, there's a range of estimates, Aaron Dubay, um, who we, we talk about, you, you guys are familiar probably with him, who's well known for his work on the minimum wage, but he's also looked at this. He came up with a somewhat smaller but comparable number of three point, about 3.3. Number of other studies have, have found lower, considerably lower numbers. Um, uh, so um, I believe all of these studies here are, are, um, are looking at um, US, uh, the United States, obviously there, there are other you know, studies that have been done in Europe, but you can see a range of estimates. The low estimates are, are a bit below one, the high estimates are you know, almost four. So as, as with a lot of this research, there, there's a lot of range and some of that is gonna, the differences are gonna imply, are gonna result from different methodologies. And some of it is asking slightly different questions. If you look at different periods of time, if you look at different kinds of spending, you would expect the answers to be different. But that at least gives you a range of the kind of numbers that people come up with um, for $100,000, maybe one, between one and four job, job years of additional employment in at least this range of studies looking at public spending in the United States. Um, so uh, if, we, if we go to the more familiar output multiplier, again, we can see a lot of ranges of estimate, a wide range of disagreement. And here I should say there are really two different ways people come up with these numbers. One is, um, is by using formal models, what typically what's called a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, DSGE model. This is in most economics departments, in the United States and in Europe today, if you're doing macroeconomic theory, you're manipulating these DSGE models. I'm going to say, frankly, I, I don't find these things informative about real economies. I don't I don't feel any need to teach people. They're they're very they're they're not super mathematical, but they're mathematical enough that they're they're very demanding. You have to invest quite a bit of time and mental energy, like you know, all of your macroeconomics training in a lot of. Uh, economic PhD programs in learning to, to be fluent in working with these models. And in my opinion, they're just not, for reasons I'm, I'm not gonna get into now, they're not informative about real economy. So there are a lot of these model-based estimates that I I just would push to one side as, as simply not, not telling us anything. But there's also a lot of, you know, mainstream economists have plenty of interesting stuff to say, especially when they're doing empirical work. And there are plenty of statistical estimates of the multiplier that I think we can learn something from. And then these generally fall into, into two categories. There's some that are what we call narrative or event-based studies, where basically they're looking for specific cases where they think you can plausibly make an argument that we're, we're really seeing a multiplier. Because the challenge, the challenge in doing this stuff statistically is that of course we see, let's say public spending changing and we see outputs changing, but we don't necessarily, we have to decide is, what is the causal relationship between these two things. For instance, if an economy goes into a recession and unemployment rises, government spending is going to increase in a lot of areas. Let's say unemployment insurance spending is gonna go up. In the US disability insurance really functions as a kind of safety net. People, people sign up for disability benefits when they can't find a job because that's, one of the few reasonably generous, you know, social insurance benefits the United States has. So spending in areas like that, of course, you know, Medicaid spending, Medicare spending, Medicaid if spending if people lose their health insurance and so on, may go up in a recession. So if you just naively look, you say, look, government spending is going up, output and employment are going down, the multiplier must be negative. But obviously, we know that's not what's going on. Um, on the other hand, there might also be periods of time where for whatever reason the government is spending more, but you know, the output is rising. If there's a boom, maybe that allows the government to, to increase its spending. And, and there's no, again, there's no cause of the causal relationship. So we need to actually find, so an event-based study is saying, basically, here's a case where we can be confident government spending is sort of changing on its own. And then we can look at the effects of output that follow that. A lot of these things historically use military spending because the assumption was that changes in military spending are not going to be driven by sort of the domestic economic situation. They're driven by whatever the political priorities of the government power, the foreign situation. So, or, or you try to identify specific cases. And some of this actually does get into sort of more 
historical work where you actually look at the budget debates and say, well, what, where, where's a case where you can identify a big change in spending or taxes that really doesn't seem to have been motivated by anything going on in the economy? And then we can say, okay, if there's a change in output and employment that follows that, we can say, okay, that's, we can attribute that you know, to being, you know, at least plausibly the result of the, of the change in spending. So that, that's sort of, and the other is what's called VAR studies, vector auto regression studies, which are, are just basically, you get a bunch of long time series data on the stuff you're interested in, you throw it in a pot and you just look if there's any systematic pattern where certain things are changing after other things. Basically, you take all the variables at time two and, and regress them on all of their values at time one and so on, you, you kind of, and then you just see what what patterns you, you find. So that's that's a less it's a, you know and they both they both have their place. They both I think potentially informative, but they're two different ways. One is is to really try to identify specific cases where you can find big changes in in the fiscal position that you that are not that are exogenous that are not responding to the economic situation and see if those then are systematically followed by by a change in output and employment. And the other is to just get a lot of data and kind of just see what patterns emerge, which is the the, the VAR approach. So people using you know, these two approaches, again, you end up seeing a wide range of, ultim of, of multipliers. So um, you know, this, this um, figure here I took from a recent, uh, a quite nice um, IMF kind of roundup of, of empirical um, evidence on the multiplier. The IMF is, is sort of interesting in this respect because until not too many years ago, they were very aggressively arguing that increased public spending, increased deficits were not an effective way to boost demand, boost output. Um, and that's not something uh, governments in, in facing unemployment should, should even be considering. And they've, the, at least the research department of the IMF has, has really shifted its line on that over the past decade. Now, when they, when they actually go in their, their country departments that are actually telling countries receiving IMF loans concretely what to do, it's not, not clear that they've always caught up with what's coming out of the research department. But the research department has really shifted its tune and, and they've published a number of useful sort of overviews of what, what is the economic evidence on the multiplier. So this, this comes from one of those and is looking at a number of different ranges of estimates of, of, of the size of multipliers. Um, you know, the, 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 the um, you know, the big, the big, the big black box here being, uh, you know, where most of the estimates fall and then the full range being shown here. So, um, uh, so, uh, so, um, and then you see here what we've seen here, they've got spending multipliers on this side, tax multipliers on this side, and then they, they're looking at estimates that are come that are, in this case, they, they're looking only at the, at the VAR, you know, empirical estimates and the DSG model based estimates. You'll notice there's not much difference between them. And of course, the reason is that is that when people are making these models, they generally tune the model so it produces something that looks looks reasonable based on the empirical evidence. Um, it's not really independent confirmation. So, um, you know, you can see that there's 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 just a wide range of estimates. Um, in general, uh, the estimated multipliers are, are are slightly higher. You know, for the U.S., you can see the range for the U.S. that they report here goes from a bit under 0.5 as high as high as two. The center of gravity here is between one and, and 1.5 in this particular sample. The um, estimates in Europe are, are, are a bit lower. Most of them are below one. And just to pause here for a moment, there, there is a sort of critical difference when your multiplier is at zero and one. And, and so let me, let me just clarify. A multiplier of a negative multiplier means that total output declines when government spending rises that an increase in government spending reduces private spending by so much that the net effect on GDP is negative. You'll notice that there are very, very few, basically no, there's, 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 there's a couple of the model-based estimates that are slightly negative here. There are no empirical estimates in, the, in this set of papers that they reviewed that show a negative multiplier, multiplier of less than zero. Um, the, uh, um, a multiplier of one is important because that means that the change in output is at least as large as the change in government spending. If the multiplier is greater than one, it means that in addition to the boost to GDP that comes from the government spending itself, there is additional private spending that's brought in. In other words, that the love, there's no crowding out. When the multiplier is greater than one, there is no crowding out. The, not only do you get all the, whatever the benefits were of the government spending, but you get additional private spending on top of that. If the multiplier is between zero and one, 
then the spending does raise overall GDP, but private spending goes down. Part of that increase in public spending is canceled out by a reduction of private spending. So if the multiplier is less than one, there is some crowding out. If the multiplier is greater than one, there is no crowding out. So that, that line here is, is important. And you can see in this particular sample of papers, most, although not all of them, find, find multipliers of less than one. And again, they, they generally are a little bit lower in Europe um, than in the United States, which you know is, is I think, there's actually good reasons why we would actually expect that to be the case. Um, and then uh, the multipliers are quite a bit larger in, 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 in on, on uh, spending changes and tax changes, implying that, you know, um, again, for, for I think good reason, we, we would expect the effect on GDP from a change in public spending to be greater than, a, than, a, than, a, than a, something that happens on the tax side. So that's just a sense of the range of estimates that are out there. So what then influences the multiplier? Why would we expect the multiplier to be lower or higher? Well, some of these, some of the factors we can get from our simple model of the multiplier. Our simple, you know, Keynesian model of the multiplier um, that we talked about in terms of the algebra of it in the in the last lecture makes some predictions for us. For instance, a country with um, that's more open to foreign trade is probably going to have a lower multiplier, and that's I think a, both both. You know, the algebra tells us that, but it's also a very reasonable thing to believe because an increase in a, in a country that's very open to trade, an increase in spending in that country, a lot of that is going to increase demand in its trade partners. So in a sense, the multiplier isn't smaller, you know, but it's if you measure it at the level of a single country, it's going to look smaller because more of that induced demand is showing up uh, somewhere else. Uh, and that's, you know, one, one reason why I think we shouldn't be surprised to see a lower multiplier in research, you know, looking at European countries in the United States, because European countries across the board trade trade more than uh, the United States does. Um, if households are liquidity constrained, we would expect a, a, a larger multiplier. And that means essentially how much are people, how much is people's consumption spending dependent on their current income? How much capacity do people have to spend money um, independent of what they currently earn, either because they have um, liquid savings that they can spend down or because they have access to credit. Um, that's obviously gonna be important because um, it's it's one of the main factors, you know, one of the two factors that, that, that generates this link or three factors, I guess, one of the two important factors that generates this link from, uh, from income to consumption that is captured in the consumption fu uh, uh, function. Uh, it also means, you know, it, it's another way of, of looking at it is if, if households are liquidity constrained, the marginal propensity to save is going to be very low. If relatively few households are liquidity constrained, if people already have plenty of liquid savings or plenty of access to credit, there's not as much reason to expect that a current increase in their income is going to lead them to consume more. Um, it could lead them to just draw down less of their, their existing savings or use less of their credit or, you know. So, so if households are liquidity constrained, we would expect a high multiplier and that's something that's going to vary over time, but also, you know, across across countries, depending on various institutional factors. We think again that, that liquidity is probably going to be higher for direct public spending than for transfers. And again, there's a basic reason in the algebra we can see that um, if you if you have direct public spending, meaning something that counts in G, building a road, building a hospital, renovating a schoolhouse, adding military spending. Um, then um, that adds to GDP immediately as the spending takes place. And then of course the incomes that the spending generates produce additional consumption spending down the road. If you're doing transfers, you don't get that initial hit, you only get the induced consumption spending. So in a sense, whatever is paid, you know, whatever is saved or paid in taxes is subtracted right up front when you're talking about transfer spending. Also, you know, there may be an additional delay um, because people, even liquidity constrained households don't you know, necessarily respond to a change in their income immediately. So in general, we think, we think direct public spending is gonna have a higher multiplier um, than, than transfers are. Um, when there's more excess capacity in the economy. So this, you know, we talk about potential output, it's, it's a target, maybe a well-defined one, maybe not a well-defined one, but it's also, you know, there is a, a fact of the matter, how easy is it for businesses to increase output when they see increased demand? In general, we think in, in the kind of economy we live in, most businesses, most of the time, are, are, are well away from their, their, their capacity constraints. Most restaurants would be happy to have more customers and would, would you know, 
seat more people if more people wanted to eat there. I mean, even in normal times, maybe not as much today. Um, you know, most most if you're if you're running a daycare, generally you're happy when more parents come because you can accommodate more more kids if if there's demand. So we think most of it, but but obviously businesses do at a certain point reach capacity limits and have trouble expanding output further. And in an economy that's already booming, that's already, you know, running hot, that's already been growing rapidly, we might think more businesses are likely to be facing supply constraints, capacity constraints, and therefore that might lead to a smaller multiplier. Central bank accommodation, as I mentioned before, is a critical factor. Um, automatic stabilizers. So this is, this is categories of, of government spending or taxes that automatically change based on the economic situation. So unemployment insurance is, is the big example in the United States. More people are unemployed, more people collect unemployment insurance, that's more public spending. An income tax is a form of automatic stabilizer. As people's income rises, they pay more in taxes. So that's sort of offsetting the rise in income. And as people's income fall, they pay less in taxes, so they lose less actual income. If the tax is a progressive one, then that stabilizer effect is gonna be, is gonna be even stronger in general. Uh, because as people's income rise, their taxes rise more than in proportion, and as their incomes fall, their taxes fall more than in proportion. So these automatic stabilizers are going to tend to reduce the size of the multiplier. Now, that's not a bad thing. In a sense, if we have a strong system of automatic stabilizers, we don't need as much you know, discretionary fiscal policy to stabilize output. But it does mean that in a country with a, a strong public safety net and a strongly progressive tax system, the, the effect of new public spending on demand is going to be muted because, you know, if you raise employment as a result of public spending, that moves people out of the, the safety net programs. And if you if people's income goes up, you know, a fair amount of that is going to be taken back as taxes. And that's another reason why we're not surprised to see lower estimates of the multiplier for European countries than for the United States. And finally, the behavior of business investment is really the, the big wild card in all this. Um, because, you know, the rest of our multiplier, we can sort of formalize in a, in a, in a or less reliable way in the sense that there is a sort of stable, you know, relationship of consumption to income. There's certainly a pretty stable relationship of imports to income. We can, we can say something about the marginal tax rate, but what business investment is responding to is often really kind of mysterious and unpredictable, and it can make a big difference here. If businesses make their investment decisions primarily based on the current state of demand, the amount they're selling, in general, that's going to lead to a bigger multiplier. You'll get a boost in investment along with your boost in consumption. But if businesses are making investment decisions in other ways, then that might not, you know, might lead to a smaller multiplier. So that's that's probably the biggest, biggest question mark in, in our sort of thinking about, about what a multiplier is likely to be. So um, again, here we're just, um, uh, Looking at a, this actually shows a couple of these dimensions. Looking at looking at you know the multipliers estimated in this case from the same IMF paper for four countries: the United States, Germany, Japan, and the UK. And again, and so we're seeing actually um, uh, four four different dimensions here um, because we're seeing um, obviously the different countries. You know, Germany, Japan, the UK, the United States, and then we're seeing. Um, uh, so, so we've got, you know, spending multipliers here. And then tax multipliers, you know, the second darker set of columns are the tax multipliers. So you can see for Germany and the United States, the tax multipliers are estimated as being smaller than the spending multipliers for whatever reason. Um, actually, am I sure? Hold on, I gotta, I gotta take a quick look at this thing. What, what is, what is? All right, so um, let's see here. Um, 
All right, here we are. Okay, so I, I misspoke a moment ago. The, the, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what's actually here. Um, the, uh, the, um, what we got here is the first, the gray here is, is one year, effect after one year, and then the, the second column is two years. Then, you know, what we've got this, this here is spending. And, and th these are taxes. Okay, so that's that's what we're looking at here. So we've got a lot of dimensions here. We've got countries, different different countries: Germany, Japan, UK, United States, and then we've got we've got one year, first year, which is the light gray, and then two years, which is the dark gray, um, and then we've got um, uh, spending multipliers, which is the first first set of columns, spending, and then the second set of columns is taxes. So a lot, of, a lot of dimensions of information here in this one, one figure. But the patterns here, I think, are, are actually pretty, pretty sensible. Most of them, some of them interesting. Um, oh, and then, then these, 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 these ones here are ones that were not statistically significant. And also, I misspoke before. I said this is from an IMF. Some of the other figures and tables that are in these slides um, that I'm going to show in a moment are from the IMF. This is actually from a. Um, a paper a couple of years ago, very useful paper reviewing, you know, the the, the evidence on fiscal multipliers by uh, someone named Aiko Minashima and, and a bunch of co-authors. Um, so, uh, so, right. So, so what we've got here, the patterns are pretty much make sense. Um, first of all, as you can see. The values estimated for the U.S. here are 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 are, the, are are higher than for Germany or the U.K. You see that the high estimate here at, is 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 um, with a negative output gap. There, you know, the, the central. This is just averaging together a bunch of empirical studies. That the typical result was 1.7. So again, as I said, 1.5 for the U.S. for a typical multiplier is is a reasonable number. They're they're showing here in this in the case of the United States the impact diminishes over over two years. So in the first year, 1.7, second year, 1.2, if there's a negative output gap. If you start from a situation where the economy is below potential, if you start from a situation where the economy is operating already above potential, the multipliers, although still positive, and in fact, still greater than one, or at least equal to one, are somewhat lower. And that same pattern is true in all of these countries, the, the multiplier with a positive output gap is, is lower than the multiplier with a negative output gap. Um, you can also see that for um, all of these, the effect of tax changes is smaller than the effect of spending changes. In fact, for the U.S. and for the U.K., there's the, the effect of tax changes is, is not significantly different from zero. And in Japan, if the output gap is already positive, the effect of, of tax cut is actually found to be negative, whether or not we believe that. But certainly consistently, the multiplier from tax changes is smaller than the multiplier from spending changes. The multiplier with a negative output gap is bigger than the multiplier with a positive output gap. The multiplier in the US and Japan, which are quite close countries, people have this idea of Japan as being this powerhouse in world trade, which historically it's certainly been very successful. But Japan is actually a country of, of the major countries in the world, one of the ones where, where foreign trade makes up the smallest part of, of their economy. So it's not surprising for that reason that we would find a larger multiplier there. And Germany and the UK, European countries, you know, big countries in the scale of things, but, but smaller than the US. And, and I, think, I think Germany is somewhat smaller even than Japan and certainly more open to trade than Japan. So for that reason, we're not, not surprised to see a, a smaller multiplier there, the UK. Estimates are very low. I'm not sure what to make of that or whether I would believe that completely. But the general pattern here, I think, is is consistent with what you're going to see in a lot of a lot of the empirical research. Um, in general, the U.S., if we compare it to most other countries, is probably going to have one of the higher multipliers. Again, maybe not the highest. Maybe Japan. This this it might be reasonable. Japan's actually a bit higher, but in general, one of the higher ones. So um, now this again, making the same point here. This is comparing. Down here, we've got um, openness to trade. So this is down down here. We've got <coughs> trade as a share of GDP. So this these numbers at the bottom, you know, there's some countries where imports make up you know close to seventy percent. This is this is looking at the OECD, the Club of Rich Countries. In the smallest ones, you know, maybe Belgium, the Netherlands, you know, imports might make up the majority of of GDP. 
close to 70% over on the right. In some countries like the US and Japan, which are gonna be these two here are gonna be the US and Japan. You know, imports are, are maybe 25% or less of GDP. And those are the countries where, you know, the estimated then, then over here is the multiplier. Yeah, you know, again, this is just sort of looking at a bunch of empirical studies and averaging the, the findings together. The multiplier in, in the US and Japan are, is, is found to be significantly greater than in any of the other rich countries. And, um, uh, you know, that's not surprising because, uh, because these are countries that are, that are relatively less, they're large countries that are not very open to trade. And there may be other factors influencing that as well. But you can see the general pattern here. There's certainly not a tight, tight relationship, but the general pattern is, is down here where we've got countries that are very open to trade. The general finding is multipliers are small. Over here where we've got countries that are less open to trade, the, the general finding is multipliers are larger. So that's not surprising from the algebra and not, not surprising in the real world. And it's is consistent with what the, you know, the bulk of the literature seems to show. Uh, so then moving on to the, the business cycle, in general, we, uh, we think that multipliers are going to probably going to be larger in periods when uh, there's a recession or as, as economists often prefer to think of it a negative output gap the, the you know the the, the the terms recession expansion recovery very very common in everyday discussions of the economy business news policy discussions not used by contemporary economists very much um, because they they tend to, and I think perhaps, mistakenly or problematically to not think in terms of regular cycles, but just there's periods where demand is relatively strong and periods where demand is relatively weak and they're not, there's not a, a consistent pattern to that. That's, that's sort of the, 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 the general feeling among most modern economists. So they don't talk about recessions versus expansions. They just talk about a negative output gap versus a positive output gap. For our purposes, we don't, we don't need to worry about that difference in nomenclature, a negative output gap or recession, same thing. So, in general, during those periods, we're likely to find a larger multiplier because again, businesses are likely to have more excess capacity at that time. That's when investment is more likely to respond strongly to demand. Um, and again, investment, as I said, is really the wild card in our estimates in the multiplier. But one thing we generally believe is that when businesses have a lot of excess capacity, when businesses, um, are producing much less than they could produce with their, their existing plant and equipment, they're very unlikely to invest much, even if they are, are operating profitably. It, it can happen that you're, you're, you're running your factory at half capacity, but you're still profiting either because um, most of your costs are, are, are not fixed costs. So you're, you're half capacity means you're operating low cost or because you, you had you know, favorable financing terms or, or whatever, you know, you, you, you could be making a lot of money even running at half capacity, but even if you are, have high profits, if you've got a lot of spare capacity, you're not probably going to want to, why, why would you increase your capacity if you're not using the capacity you have? And investment in general is something you do to raise, raise your capacity, to, you know, to increase the amount that you can produce. So if you've got a lot of excess capacity, you're not like to invest, even if profitability is good, even if credit is readily available. So that's, that's one reason that we think, um, the multiplier will be larger because in a recession, you really need to boost demand in order to um, get businesses to invest. So we're more likely to see a positive reaction on, on, on business investment versus in a boom where, where there might be other, other factors that would be more important. And then again, this issue of monetary accommodation in a downturn, um, uh, central banks presumably are hoping to boost output already. So they're not gonna be inclined to offset what the, uh, what the fiscal authorities are doing if, if there's some kind of stimulus coming from, from the budget, not, or, or let's say a, a stimulus from a big boost in exports or something. Uh, in any case, empirically, it seems to be a pretty consistent finding. Um, and then secondly, of course, um, larger with monetary accommodation. If the central bank does not take action to offset the, uh, the change in demand. And, and this sort of funny language is basically coming from an older vision of monetary policy, where we really did think of the central bank as setting a, the money supply, changing the quantity of money. And the notion was, if you have a big boost in spending, and the money stock stays the same, then interest rates are likely to rise. So 
the central bank has to accommodate the rise in demand by allowing the money. Now, in the, in the modern world, we don't think central banks are controlling the money supply. An increase in private sector activity is going to generate all the additional money that it requires um, through the operations of the banking system. So here, we're not talking about the central bank allowing the money supply to rise. The question is whether the central bank actively raises interest rates or takes other active steps to restrain credit growth um, in response to a shift in demand. But either way, the, the question of what the central bank is going to do, and that's certainly a lot of the um, probably difference in empirical results depends on, on differences in central bank behavior. So if the central bank is going along with it, maybe they want stronger demand. That's likely to be the case in a depression. Or maybe they, they, they the central bank is not an independent player here. Maybe they're cooperating with the fiscal authority. During World War II in the United States, you know, the Federal Reserve was really just subordinated to the Treasury as, as part of the war effort. They didn't, they did not, there was no monetary policy in the modern sense. The central bank fixed interest rates um, at a, at a certain level and just left them there and, and were basically willing to do whatever, you know, the treasury said it needed in order to make sure the US could finance the war effort. And, and there's plenty of historical cases in other countries where the central bank is really just subordinated to the government. Um, or of course, there's other cases where there is not a central bank at the relevant level. If we're looking at, at the, at a, 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 let's say if we're estimating the multiplier at the level of a US state, there's no question of monetary accommodation or offset because US states do not have their own central banks. A US state is gonna get the same monetary policy as the rest of the United States, no matter what happens to public spending in that particular state. And the same is to some extent true in the Euro area, although maybe not as completely true as people think, uh, but, but in any case, you know, arguably at least to some extent, you've got a Europe wide monetary policy. So if an individual government you know, has more spending for whatever reason, there's less, less reason to expect you're gonna have any sort of offset from, from the central bank in that case. In any case, if for whatever reason the central bank is is passive, is not trying to offset that, then then our our multiplier is going to end up looking bigger. So um, again, just looking at some evidence on this. Um, so here, this is this is from um, I think this is from a different paper, uh, or maybe it's from the same one. I I don't know. Anyway, it's another survey of of multipliers. Um, Looking, looking just at, at, at a range. So what you see here, the, the key thing here, um, this Arabek Gorodnichenko paper was one of the first ones that really got people rethinking about the multiplier. But anyway, a bunch of, bunch of ones that were done, you know, shortly after the Great Recession. And, and the point here is that we consistently find, see these guys finding much lower multipliers during an expansion than during a recession. So in this, 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 this paper, which again was very influential, you know, about a decade ago, they, they found that um, during expansions, the multiplier was significantly less than one. There was crowding out. Um, more public spending, you know, or, or let's say the argument would be fiscal surpluses during the 90s were associated with higher private spending. Crowding out works, works both ways. Lower public spending would imply higher private spending if the multiplier is less than one. So here we've got, you know, in, in expansions and booms, a multiplier of less than one, but in a recession, a multiplier quite high, 2.5, which is a high number, but, but obviously the combination of these two numbers would be consistent with a sort of overall multiplier in the vicinity of 1.5 or, or even lower. Um, but this, this, this is their finding, a multiplier much larger in a recession than an expansion, and this is consistent with a number of these other studies. This one for the United States, here's one for the Euro area as a whole. The Euro area as a whole, we would expect to have a multiplier comparable to the, to the US one. And, and, and that's what these, these guys find. And then this is another one uh, for Germany. And again, not surprisingly, looking at Germany in isolation, we find lower numbers. But again, the key point here is that the, uh, the, it's, still, it's still higher in a recession than in, a, in an expansion. So again, this is, what we would sort of logically expect to be the case seems to be what we see in the um, uh, empirical work. Now, another set of questions is the time that this all takes. The, the persistence the, of the multiplier and the, um, the sort of the, the persistence, both, both how long it lasts and how long it takes. So, um, you know, when we think about the multiplier, we're, we're really thinking about a process that happens over time you get higher income. Let's say you get your stimulus check. If we all get our $1,400 checks from the Biden administration, as, as you know, I think most of us are hoping that we do, or $2,000 checks if it works out that way, or 
you know, some smaller number if, if, if it works out that way. In any case, we're going to get those checks and then we're going to go out and spend money as a result of getting those checks, but we're not going to spend the money on the same day that we receive the checks. In most cases, we're going to, we're going, there's going to be some kind of delay that this happens. Our spending decisions, in some cases, the, 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 the production is simultaneous with the spending. If you go and you get a haircut, if you get some other kind of service, then the, the, the decision to buy it and the production of it happen at the same moment. But in other cases, they don't. And in other cases, there's a delay here. Um, then production generates incomes, but again, not instantly. If businesses adjust their staffing level and, and, and generate new wage income, that's something that takes time. And if they don't adjust their staffing level, if they're able to change production with their current employees, then you're generating profits but those profits are going to take a while, again, to be distributed to whoever is ultimately going to receive them. So each step here takes time. And so when we're, when we're looking at, at sort of either doing empirical work or we're doing talking about policy, we, we have to actually think, well, how, how long are we, are we talking about here? Now, many models um, just look at the current year because it's simpler. The CBO, Congressional Budget Office, that gets a lot of attention because of their role in sort of coming up with sort of official projections of, of economic impacts of various bills and what the budget situation is going to be in future years. Um, they, they, because of the nature of their job, you know, it's not just to come up with the best forecast, but a sort of simple transparent forecast that can be a baseline for discussion. So for maybe understandable or maybe problematic reasons, they also do this. They, they have the entire, whatever effect public spending is going to have on GDP happens in the year after the spending takes place. That's it. But you know that's that's convenient. It's easier, but it's it's not really very realistic. It's not doesn't really make sense, and it's also not really consistent with what uh, we see again in the empirical work on multipliers, which often suggests that it takes several years for the full effect on GDP to show up. And of course, theoretically, you could you could have a view where um, demand effects are, are fully persistent, and and a change in GDP due to a shift in demand. That's just that just sets GDP on a new path that it, it follows indefinitely. That's that's a perfectly logically possible thing to believe. It's it's not what people who talk about multipliers generally do believe, and and most of the empirical work does seem to suggest an effect that sort of falls off over time. But you know we can we can we can debate that one. But in any case, what what we what, what does seem to be pretty clear is that there's at least some you know some effects well beyond the period in which the spending takes place. Um, and the total effect, uh, you know, might be might be multiple times what you see in the initial year. So this now this this table does come from the IMF, and this is not based on any specific study. It's it's sort of their representative example of 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 what you know based on on the on the research they survey what a kind of typical impact might look like. So here, you know, in their in their sort of typical case, this is they 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 talk about in terms of fiscal tightening rather than expansion. These these terms get used: loosening, expansion, tightening, contraction, just synonyms. Uh, fiscal tightening means moving the budget towards surplus, a, a reduction in spending or increase in taxes. So in their sort of representative case, um, the multiplier, if we just look at the at the year in which the change actually takes place, is going to be 0.8. It's going to be less than one in that year, but then it's going to be increased to, to one in the following year, and then we'll see an effect uh, two years after the spending. Oh, well, two years after the spending, the effect is going to be pretty comparable to what it was in the year of the spending, and then there's still going to be a noticeable effect three years after the spending. So if you took something like this seriously, then you'd say, you know, if the stimulus bill gets, gets signed and the money checks start going out right now, that's going to have a significant effect on GDP in 2021, but it's going to have an even bigger effect on GDP in 2022, a substantial effect on GDP in 2023, and a noticeable effect on G GDP in 2024. So again, this is this is just sort of a representative case, but again, this is this this is an IMF kind of review of kind of the, the literature and then they kind of summarizing like what 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 typically based on these studies would we would we think the time pattern might look like. So that's again if we're having a policy debate, let's say about the Biden stimulus now, we really do need to have some some view on this, how much of the effect is going to show up in this year and how much in future years, because if it's mostly, you know, here you can see, you know, just again using these numbers, they've they've got a total multiplier of 2.7. But it's sp spread out over four years, so um, you know only less than a third of that impact is in is in the year that the spending actually takes place. So if we believe something like this, then if we're trying to assess 
the appropriate size of a stimulus, we really should not just be asking what's the output gap in 2021, but what do we expect it's going to be in 2022, 2023, 2024? If we believe, which a lot of people do believe, there's going to be a substantial output gap in those out years as well, then the appropriate size of the stimulus package is going to get, you, it should be bigger because, because you're having a big effect in those, in those future years as well. But in any case, whether you believe this or whether you think like the CBO that is more front loaded, as soon as we're talking about multipliers in the real world, it is something you have to have a view on one way or the other. Um, finally, the, 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 the sort of hardest piece of this is the question of investment. Um, now, in our models, we, we typically treat investment as exogenous. Investment is something that just changes for reasons that are outside the model. In fact, you know, in Keynes's original version of the multiplier, it was an investment multiplier. Keynes, in the general theory, uh, doesn't talk about fiscal policy at all, which is kind of funny if, if you think about how sort of Keynesianism is, is imagined today. I shouldn't say he doesn't talk about it at all, but he talks about it very little. It is, it is very far from, from the centerpiece of the discussion. And in a lot of his policy writing from the 30s, it's not the centerpiece. His focus was not on, on public spending, you know, government spending in the normal sense to stabilize the economy, but how to stabilize investment spending. Now, part of his answer to how to stabilize investment spending was to move a lot of private investment spending to some more or less quasi public status, but not necessarily government spending as we think of it. You know, you could have a national investment authority that would kind of tell businesses how much to invest and then, and then give them, you know, the, the loans on favorable terms to do it, but leave the actual investment in private hands, something, something like that. They were different versions. In any case, he's not mainly talking about public spending. He's mainly talking about investment spending as the thing that, that is driving fluctuations in the economy and is, is the thing where we really are trying to figure out what the multiplier will be. So, um, but in, in, in a lot of, so in a lot of, a lot of models, you know, from Keynes, we start with saying, well, investment is what it is. And now let's ask, you know, what the, what the ultimate effect on GDP is going to be via the multiplier. But obviously in the real world, we would expect that it's very possible that businesses investment decisions are going to be influenced by the level of public spending and the level of demand. And because investment in some ways is, is the most variable, the most, the most susceptible to change of the major components of GDP, the, 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 the response of investment to a change in exogenous spending, a change in government spending, a change in demand is going to be really important in, in determining what the multiplier ultimately ends up being. So essentially, I've listed four, four factors here, which I think we can agree in general are the big four factors in business investment decisions. Current demand, current sales, how much are you selling today relative to what you're capable of producing? Current profits, we know that we live in a capitalist economy where production is organized around the pursuit of profit. So businesses' decisions about whether they want to expand their capacity is obviously gonna be influenced by, by their current profitability. Um, in a lot of cases, also businesses finance, pay for investment out of their current profits. So that's a second channel, these matter. Then, then financing, okay, in many cases they pay for investment out of current profits, but in many more cases they pay for investment by borrowing the money in some form or, or very rarely issuing stock. So that's financing. So the conditions by, under which they can finance investment are gonna influence investment. Um, if it's easy to get loans, if interest rates are low, if credit is relatively available, all else equal, we'll expect to see more investment. If it's very hard to get loans, if interest rates are high, if businesses are having trouble servicing their existing debt already and want to you know, reduce their debt, we'll expect to see investment is low. And finally, there's, there's this piece, which is business confidence, which is uh, uh, an interesting question, but obviously there is a big subjective element to investment. And so the, the sort of mood of business owners is, is going to be a factor. So how are these different factors going to influence the multiplier? Well, if we think investment, just to be clear, I wrote I for investment. If, if we think investment is going to respond strongly to demand, to current demand, then um, uh, we're going to see a larger multiplier because, you know, as, as um, you spend money, you go to the restaurant, you buy a meal. Okay, that meal counts in GDP. That's, that's part of C, consumption. But in addition, in order to serve more customers, the restaurant has to hire more servers and busboys and, and the rest of it. Um, and, and so um, 
they're then getting an income, they go out and spend money and that's additional consumption spending we see and so on. But in addition, if business is good enough, the business, the, the restaurant may decide they want to expand, um, uh, you know, acquire more space, um, you know, make those, those outdoor seating areas uh, permanent. I don't think that's actually takes a lot of investment, but it takes some. And um, so, so if businesses are basing their investment decisions on current output, um, then we're going to see uh, we're going to see a, a big multiplier, um, and you know residential investment also could could be grouped in here because if if that's responsive for the same types of reasons consumption is to, to current income, that's a big big factor as well. Um, so so if if we've got a strongly if 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 the big factor in investment is demand, we're going to tend to see a bigger multiplier, um, and. Um, uh, you know, a stronger positive response to increases in public spending. If investment depends on current profits, we will probably also see a larger multiplier because again, the level of capacity utilization is a big factor in profitability. Generally speaking, you're selling goods at a positive margin. You are selling goods at a positive markup. You're selling goods at greater than the cost of producing them. And therefore, every additional good you sell is an addition to your profits. And if you, um, you know, if you can sell more with your current capital stock, then it's also an increase in, in the rate of profit that you are making. So in general, we would expect to see um, this factor increasing the multiplier, but not always because other things happen when output rises. In particular, the costs of business may also rise. If, if um, wages tend to rise um, as a result of uh, strong demand, and there's lots of good reason to think they do. That might seem positive from the point of view of the multiplier because you know that's 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 effectively going to be a you know a a a stronger response of consumption. But but on the flip side, if wages rise as a result of of stronger demand and 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 stronger employment and stronger labor market, then that is coming out of corporate profits, and therefore you know you're going to have lower profitability and potentially a negative effect on investment from there. And you know we could also you know potentially see the same thing with things like, you know, urban rents, um, you know, if, if, if you get a boom, uh, you know, real estate demand gets stronger, certainly a big factor in New York, um, commercial rents go up. And so profits actually could decline in a boom because of that, and that might offset the multiplier. So in general, we think um, the relationship from profits to investment probably strengthens the multiplier, but under some circumstances, it might go the other way. Now, if financing is the big factor, if the big constraint on investment is can you pay for it, meaning can you borrow money on reasonable terms in order to pay for it, then that's where you know this question of monetary accommodation really is going to become decisive. If, if, if the central bank is raising interest rates to offset a boom that they see as excessive, that they see as likely to lead to overheating in the economy, that that's going to show up, first of all, in a decline in investment. Investment is, is the component of GDP that's really sensitive to interest rates. So if, if, we, um, if we think we're not going to have monetary accommodation, we think the central bank is going to be raising interest rates, then um, we're going to see typically a decline in investment. And especially, again, residential investment, housing construction is, 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 is I think, pretty clearly under most circumstances, the most interest sensitive part of the economy. So that's, that's probably the big place. Um, if 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 this if there's a negative effect here, that's going to show. Up. On the other hand, if there's a boom, that that effect is not going to come into play. And it's even conceivable that over the course of a boom, credit gets easier. Banks get more optimistic, more willing to lend, and so this this factor can actually um, uh, increase the size of the multiplier. And then we get to this thing, and this is this is the real fly in the ointment here, because. We do have a, a, an economy, a political system in which investment decisions are predominantly in the, in the hands of the owners of wealth. There are professional managers at most corporations, but those managers are on some level to some degree answer to the shareholders who are the notional owners of those corporations. And of course, today, those managers at the top level themselves typically are very, very wealthy uh, people and, and major shareholders in the companies they manage. So. Uh, so the, the, um, the business investments uh, decisions of, of, of corporations depend to some significant degree on whether those people feel good about the world. Again, precisely because 
future profitability, future demand conditions are very, very hard to predict, very hard to know with any certainty, and perhaps even more difficult to predict in the sort of setting in which we would be interested in the multiplier, for instance, if you're in a depressed economy and trying to move it towards recovery, or if there's some dispute about you know, how, how strong growth the economy can sustain. It's going to be harder than usual to predict you know, how, how profitability and demand are going to look a few years from now, or how financial conditions are going to look a few years from now, because if you take out debt, Obviously, one thing you wonder about is, you know, if I have to roll over this debt in a few years, is it going to be easy or difficult to do that? Or if you're going to, you know, spend down your financial reserves, you wonder, you know, if some other expense comes up, can I easily, you know, get credit or am I, would I be better off holding on to these reserves? So all those sorts of things really, really depend in some degree on the, on the sort of mood, the confidence of business owners. And this, you know, historically has been a big problem for countries that, that have sought to use fiscal policy aggressively because the dependence on private investment means that if a government um, begins taking actions that the, that the owners, wealth owners see as, as unsound, unsustainable, threatening, likely to lead to you know, a redistribution of wealth or to political programs they, they're against or to an empowerment of workers because of low unemployment, that may really undermine their willingness to invest. This is the theme uh, of um, Michael Koletsky's um, political uh, aspects of full employment, which most of you have read, I believe. Um, but it's also something that, that's been a real challenge for, um, uh, for, for left-wing governments, you know, from, from early in the 20th century. And, you know, certainly in certain places, um, there's an argument, uh, you know, Wolfgang Streeck, who some of you may have, may have read, has made this argument, I think, very forcefully, maybe too forcefully, but it has some relevance for Europe, that, that the sort of full employment in, in Europe in the 60s and 70s kind of undermined itself by making businesses um, pessimistic about the future and unwilling to invest. So this, this factor can really be, if you're, if you're asking, you know, the situation where you might see a negative multiplier, it would be because of a, a severe negative response of, of business owners and managers to an expansion in public spending. Now, let me say this, this, this gets exaggerated sometimes. There, there, there's um, Albert Alicina and, and some of his co-authors and, um, and um, then in a somewhat different vein, uh, well, he, he's the big name. There's other people who've, who've made the same argument. Um, uh, he passed away, I think about a year ago, Italian economist who was also at Harvard. Um, but a number of other people really made the argument that this factor is so strong that in many cases the multiplier will be negative and then you get something called expansionary austerity where a cut in public spending will actually boost GDP because it will have such a strong positive effect on investment due to its effect on business confidence. Now other people have made fun of this as, as invoking the confidence fairies that this is something you can't measure, you can't directly observe, you just say it's out there. Um, and, and I think clearly the, the empirical work has not supported this as a general proposition. But, you know, it's something we have to be realistic about that in, in an economy that is, is substantially organized through, you know, private control over our, 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 our organizations of production and, and, and investment decisions, a program that, that really makes the owners of private wealth very frightened and unhappy is going to have a negative, negative re result on, on investment. And, Obviously, again, empirically, this does not seem to be the, a dominant result in many cases. In fact, business owners who are more scared of depression and maybe the social unrest that would lead to, you know, the confidence effect can easily go the other way and, and strengthen the multiplier. But, but there is certainly the potential of this, this factor as, as, as playing a role. It's something that, you know, has been emphasized on the, you know, by people on the right, like Alicina, who want to argue for austerity and, and cutbacks to public spending, but also by people on the left who, who see it as a, as, a, as a problem that public spending programs need to be prepared to overcome and potentially as an argument for moving, you know, some of those investment decisions into the public sector so that you're no longer as dependent on, on, on business confidence. But, but clearly, if we're, if we're, if, you know, if, if we're thinking about a multiplier in a real world context, this is, this is something that we do have to, um, have to think about to some some degree, although again, it can also be exaggerated. So um, just ending with a quote from Keynes, the general theory on, on this point, um, he says, um, uh, it is safe to say that enterprise which depends on hope stretching into the future benefits the community as a whole. There are many useful things we would like to do, all sorts of, let's say, transportation infrastructure, research and development on, on new, new drugs or medical treatments, um, you know, um, 
putting up apartment buildings, which which last for you know a century or more. Um, you know the uh, um, you know the, the one I'm sitting in is is 80 years old, but that's actually a relatively newer newer building by New York standards. So these things last a lot of our our, our means of production last a long time, and it's good that we have them. But that creates a problem when you're when you're making investment decisions. So Kane says. Um, it's safe to say that an enterprise which depends on hope stretching into the future benefits the community as a whole. But individual initiative will only be adequate when reasonable calculation is supplemented and supported by animal spirits so that the thought of ultimate loss, which often overtakes pioneers, as experience undoubtedly tells us in them, is put aside as a healthy man puts aside the expectation of death. Uh, this means, unfortunately, so he's saying, he's saying here, you know, a lot of the useful stuff that we do is going to produce benefits many years in the future, but we can't really predict uh, what's going to happen many years in the future. And it's especially difficult um, to predict what, what the sort of financial returns are going to be from this project many years in the future. Um, because even, you know, a building that, that lasts, holds up, continues to serve its function, you know, as a place to house people, I can look at the building and see how it's built and the materials and say this building should, should last 100 years and function. Is this neighborhood going to be a fancy, pricey, expensive neighborhood where the building will get a high rent, or is it going to be, you know, a, a neighborhood that's considered undesirable? What's going to be the type of regulation of rents? What's going to be, you know, the type of taxes that a landlord pays? That second set of questions you don't have to answer if you just want to know: Is this a good, well-designed residential building that's going to produce public benefits into the future, social benefits? But you do have to answer them if you're pursuing profit and, and wondering if it's worth it for you. So, so the pursuit of profit involves you with a bunch of other much more difficult questions beyond simply the fact that you have to predict the, the sort of use value of this thing thing going forward, which is hard enough. Um, so what Kane says is, you know, people can't calculate it. So they have to just go forward in a sort of confident state that they hope for the best and, and want to do something. And then he continues, this means, unfortunately, not only that slumps and depressions are exaggerated in degree, but that economic prosperity is excessively dependent on a political and social atmosphere which is congenial to the average businessman. If the fear of a labor government or a new deal depresses enterprise, this need not be the result either of a reasonable calculation or a plot with political intent. It is the mere consequence of upsetting the delicate balance of spontaneous optimism. In estimating the prospects of investment, we must have regard, therefore, to the nerves and hysteria and even the digestions and reactions to the weather of those upon whose spontaneous activity it largely depends. So, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, it can be a very um, conservative argument to say, you know, investment is so irrational on some level that we just have to cater to all of the whims, the hopes, just the, yeah, the digestion, the, the, the spontaneous optimism of the people in whom we have entrusted those decisions or have at least you know, claimed and seized control of those decisions by virtue of, of owning private wealth. Now we're, we're dependent on keeping them happy if we want all of these useful forms of collective activity to take place. Or it could be um, you know, an argument that maybe we should, we should shift these decisions uh, somewhere else and make them on, on a different basis. But, but either way, and I think you know, this, to me, this passage is, 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 is completely timely for, for you know, the, the present world. It's, it's a factor both sort of empirically, if you're asking why might we find a low multiplier in some setting or a high multiplier, but also one you know, from a political standpoint, we have to have some, some view about whether, uh, how, 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 you know, if, 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 if this is gonna be, have an effect on, on private investment decisions that go beyond the sort of straightforward effects of, of uh, you know, demand and, and, and so on that we can, we can more easily calculate. And I'll stop there. <laughs>